We are going to be talking about the great microlearning AI debate, which this is going to be a fun topic and also very timely. Um, I'm looking forward to getting into this one with the two of you. We got some really good feedback on the panel discussion last time. So this is going to be this is going to be good. I've been talking way too much about AI, which I won't I will keep it focused on the micro learning piece. We won't I will keep us on track here. Um, but for those of you who are curious about this whole generative AI thing and want to go deeper, check out my YouTube channel. I've done about 4 hours worth of content on this um, just to kind of help people get grounded yeah. in like, what should we be thinking about? What does it mean for L and D? What are the ethical implications? Like, how do we do this? Well, um, so be sure to check that out, but Mike and Kate, let's narrow the focus of this on the micro learning piece. But I do think there's some, do we want to stay in the realm of generative AI or what do you think, Kate? This is your panel. Well, actually, uh, just uh, talking about kind of a uh, micro learning and AI is kind of a, um, probably not really fair since AI uh, is so much wider and implications are broader and uh, probably we can touch everything. Like I uh, drafted a couple of questions that actually came to me uh, after watching your uh, YouTube videos, Christopher. And um, oh, you I'm watched really it? I'm flattered, yeah. Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. How, how, how many days do we have to talk about this? How many days is this? I, I, well, that's what I said. I, that my job is to keep us on track so we don't go too far off because this is everybody get ready. Let's see a, a GIF on this one. Get ready to take the red pill because Neo and Morpheus, <laughs> we are going into the matrix, folks. Um, but let's start with this one because what is your opinion? I'm curious, both Mike and Kate. What do you think in terms of AI and what it's going to do for the learning? Where do you sit on this? If you were Commodus, would you be thumbs up, thumbs to the side, thumbs down? Where, where's your head at with things? Um, I can start uh, just uh, probably kicking off the discussion since uh, before thinking kind of a uh, of what we can discuss here, I thought that uh, to my opinion, um, AI looks like um, a means and it's actually like money. You can do uh, something good, you can purchase something for better and you can do lots of harm. And it all boils down to the way you, um, you're you looking uh, forward to utilize it, to apply it. And of course, it, it really comes down to you being really conscious and thoughtful in the ways you'd like to um, make the best use of it. And actually that's... <laughs> Probably we can end the discussion here since it's um, <laughs> <laughs> the answer. I don't know, Mike. Done. There you go. You. All right. Panel over. Thanks, Kate. And I <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike, I'm curious. I'm curious your take on it. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Kate. It, it, it is a tool. I think it's um, pretty powerful. Um, it's not, it's certainly not perfect. I, I would never, you know, take verbatim or copy paste the stuff that I get out of there. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits which we can get into, but there's also some challenges around uh, bias and security and that sort of stuff too. So I think, I think we should be using it, but we should use it thoughtfully and okay. intentionally. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, I, uh, what I, what I agree with is the Peter Parker principle with like great power comes great responsibility. And I would say largely, I don't think most people even are quite aware what we're dealing with yet in terms of like how powerful this stuff is. I think it's one of those, you know, oh, it's really cool. I can like ask Ch G chat GPT to like write this thing for me and it does it. And this is far more powerful than I think a lot of people realize. So I'm curious. So I agree with you. I think we're all on the same page that like, hey, there's a good use, bad use. I'm actually curious, personal opinion though, where do you think we're going to go in terms of the change curve right now? Because I'm seeing it ramp up and there are some things I'm encouraged by and there's also a lot of things I'm really discouraged by. Um, uh, you know, uh, in fact, I started uh, thinking about this topic because I've seen lots of uh, folks kind of a... Um, complaining and speculating about whether AI will replace anyone. And since I am uh, a representative of Seven Tabs, kind of a platform where we utilize AI, and I see how fast things are kind of uh, 
going to develop. I think that we are somewhere in the very, very beginning of this whole journey. And uh, even like, you know, with seven tabs, today we release this new AI functionality that I would never for the life of me imagine half a year ago that would be there in seven tabs. So it's so very unpredictable. And uh, the good news is that with the open AI and all those technologies and new opportunities, we as founders, as uh, software entrepreneurs can um, understand how we can actually make the best use out of it. And um, I don't know, actually, I cannot predict what kind of um, solutions and functionality it uh, may help us to develop in kind of a few months later, because it's really yeah. impressive how things are kind of uh, developing at the moment. It's impressive. Yeah. It's a bit scary, but... Um, um, I think that um, we at Seven Tabs try to leverage um, the use of this technology uh, while empowering our core functionality. Seven Tabs is always like Seven Tabs. We don't uh, we don't add anything that actually contradicts our product vision and um, doesn't yeah. uh, you know yeah. respond to what we believe in. And that's how we actually. We, we can even not mention that it is AI powered technology. It still be the same seven taps with the same experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so not to worry about whether uh, some technology may come and replace you as a person who creates some really great content, because it's always be about your expertise, creativity and real human being who actually, if we speak, for example, about chat GPT, uh, writes those prompts and validates the information like Again, you can get all sorts of information there, but is it valid? Is it um, kind of a, does it stand for some ethical norms and moral? It's only up to a real human being to understand uh, all of that stuff. Well, and I think the point you hit on that, and Mike, I have a question for you right after this, that I think we just have to be careful with, just from a human psychology standpoint, there is something powerful about something speaking to you like a human. And that's one of the things that I've observed is because it's speaking in natural language, it speaks with a degree of authority that if you're not careful, you're kind of like, oh, okay. Like I asked it and it told me this. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, wait, hang on type of thing. And it just, it messes with your head a little bit because you do start to go, oh, wait. Um, you know, the best, analog the, the best analogy I use with people when they ask me about it is I'm like, treat it like a really intelligent intern. Like, that's how I like to think about it. Is it super smart? Can it do some things that'll blow your mind? Yes. But it's like that intern where you wouldn't just like let it go crazy because it's going to end up doing something that you're going to go, oh, no. Oh, no. We're going to have to like walk this back big time if we're not careful. Um, but Mike, I'm curious, where are you seeing through things like, where are you seeing some real time early adoption and positive usage of it? Well, I, I've seen some several pretty good examples of creative uses and and i know josh was going to be here and i wish he could have been here to share some of the really cool stuff that he's been doing yeah. so so um he's been sharing stuff on, on his youtube channel around um uh, video production for for learning videos around writing scripts and shot sheets and stuff like that that he's using chat gpt to sort of sort of help with yep. and i and i totally agree that it's sort of like your your assistant, right? Let's say, or to use Microsoft's terminology, we'll call it a co-pilot, right? So yeah. somebody there helping you in the in the seat, but you're still in charge. To, to Kate's point, um, uh, if you've seen Philippa Hardman is another person who's doing a lot of stuff around AI and ChatGPT and stuff specifically for L and D people, and you know I, I think it's that assistant. T to me, it's also in in some ways a thinking partner. So if I'm trying to to dig into something and to be able to have a conversation and ask questions and then clarify. And so it's sort of a learned skill to be able to, the more you practice, I think the more effective you get with having those sort of yeah. prompt conversations. And so yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's um, you know, it does a lot of stuff for me. So for example, you know, your four hours of video that you've talked about that I might take a tool and summarize that and figure out, okay, these are the yeah. spots I want to dig into that closer and then go actually watch those sec segments instead of watching the whole four hours. And so, you know, 
obviously content creation, yep. content summarization, sort of thinking partners. Yeah, I think there's there's tons of ways that um, will. I don't think it will replace us. I think it will make us more efficient and let us spend time on more important things. Yeah, exactly. I, go for it. Go for it, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, just I couldn't help. I couldn't help agreeing here because I think that the best use of it is like to augment um, human beings' creativity, expertise, and of course, some of the jobs may be probably not replaced, but they are too low in the kind of a they are too mechanical, and uh, those folks who are currently doing that kind of things can actually be promoted and do something faster with the help of those assistants. And uh, again. Um, a good business always thinks about their effectiveness and if they have enough tools, solutions that can um, m make, help the employees do job faster, quicker, in a more effective way, it's not like, uh, you know, uh, saying goodbye to all the folks in the company and replacing with artificial intelligence. It won't help much, actually. Uh, but you can do so much better things if you are equipped with great tools and Again, the next question is how you can evaluate whether those uh, tools are really good enough and powerful to you and effective because with this, you know, hype around uh, so many new technologies and solutions appear. And uh, again, it's about you validating uh, what can they do for you. Yeah, well, and I think, um, you know, where, where, we're, where we're talking about this is, I mean, there there are some things, I saw a comment about it before, um, where I do think there is some legitimate spaces where it is going to eliminate the need for things. And if your job is doing those things and you continue just doing those things, it's a real risk. I mean, you know, switchboard operator and lamplighter used to be jobs. I mean, they used to be real careers that people went into and they just flat out don't exist anymore. And I do, that is one of the things that I think is a real risk to our industry. Because if you look at content creation in just the raw form of, I need to just generate something, AI can probably do it faster and better than you can, you know, just in raw form. Now, if you're not taking the critical thought and the creativity and you're doing that and you're just going, hey, I have a PowerPoint and I just need to schluck it into SCORM and get it out there and maybe make it look pretty, Microsoft Copilot, Google Bard, ChatGPT is going to be able to do it better than you today, probably even better than you can in another six to 12 months type of a thing. And I think that's one of the journeys that we're on right now is to your point, Kate, starting to redefine what is our role in this and how does it augment us in a way that still keeps us extremely relevant? And I'm optimistic because to me, I look at it, um, I've got several people on my teams looking deeply at what are all the implications? Where can it streamline our operations? Where are all the different things that we can do? How can it augment our processes? Um, but in a way that doesn't diminish us, um, but actually makes us better. And I, I think it really it really reiterates the point of, you know, in today's fast pace of change and developments and stuff, you really can't afford to get complacent. And it's just another reminder, like if you're not continuously learning and keeping up, then you're falling behind. Yeah. Uh, you know, while you were speaking, Christopher, it reminded me of one kind of a uh, probably similar situation. About 15 years ago, most of solutions were kind of a server based and lots of companies would have uh, lots of um, real kind of a physical server somewhere in their storage rooms in their offices. And there were people who maintained all of that stuff and managed the processes. And then cloud based solutions appeared. And every company, every yeah. uh, technology uh, started saying about themselves, we are cloud-based, we are kind of a, uh, so very flexible in usage. And uh, there were so many concerns about uh, this actually uh, process because people could be fired and um, there were lots of concerns about privacy and all the stuff. But we are here nowadays and we suppose that probably every a uh, good solution is cloud-based so that it allows us to be more flexible. And that's okay. Those people who actually dealt with the servers earlier, they kind of started doing some other stuff. They adapted. And they noted. Yeah. So we cannot stop the progress. We can make the best no. use of it. 
Well, so, and by the way, Jason, I invited you to the stage because my my AI algorithm suggested that. So feel free to jump in on the conversation at any point. This is just a fireside chat. I think one of the concerns I have, Kate, on your point though, that I do think we have to be careful about is that if we study the course of human history, <laughs> we have a bad habit of pursuing progress without considering the implications until we've scorched the earth. And then we turn around and go like, oh snap, if only we'd thought about some of these things ahead of time. And I do think when we look at burnout statistics and some of these other things, there is the real possibility that we could just go more is better and faster is better. And like to no end. And it's like, well, wait, what are we actually doing? And are we actually, I I'm hopeful that we actually use this to create more room for us to think deeply and critically about things instead of just going, great, now you can create 700 <laughs> objects that you can pump out into your organization instead of seven. And that's amazing. So let's just keep exponentially going greater, which is going to just, I mean, and that's, again, I won't go into the whole side of it that you can go to YouTube and watch my video on the ethical things that to consider. But Jason, I'd love your take on it. Uh, probably, uh, if you allow me to jump in with my uh, two cents, um, uh, actually, I'd love Jason to cover some risks uh, that he sees, like um, uh, of involving uh, students and people of some earlier generation to AI. Because we, as learning development professionals, we are pretty mature actually to understand the consequences. Um, we have concerns, and as for some teenagers, actually, it may be really. Uh, scary, like uh, people can, you know, stop thinking creatively because they can always go and um, find an answer there. And I know that Jason, actually, you've implemented a really nice strategy of asking students actually to show how they uh, build their prompts and show the process of uh, finding the answer. Yeah, because so much of what you get out of AI is what you put into it, right? Garbage in, garbage yes. out something good in, something good out. 100%. And there's so much work, especially early on, that has to go into just figuring out how to engineer a prompt. And Sam Altman has talked about this too. One of his points was that ChatGPT is awful. It's awful from a user experience perspective, right? His claim was that it's always down and we all spent weeks trying to figure out how to use it. And theoretically, you shouldn't have to do that. And my suspicion is that in the next year, we won't have to do that. And right now in the journey of AI, we're so early in the process, right? That ChatGPT, now you have auto GPT, so an AI that can prompt itself. Um, you also have yeah. now Upwork with AI. So what they've done is they've created a bunch of different bots that will simulate because then you can fine tune the AI to really think like someone in instructional design or someone who's a professor or someone who does this. And if you do that and you're just hiring through that, that sort of changes it too. But we're so early and it's literally changing every day, every week. Um, and it's, it's so early on in the process. So it's hard to figure out how to make AI work for us. And I, I think you're totally right in the sense that we have to be purposeful. We have to be ethical. We have to think big picture. And that's going to be the best yeah. way to incorporate it, I think, long term. Well, and I think that's where um, there's a lot of, you know, I think for people at all levels of the organization, but I think one of the things that I see, at least where I'm sitting, working with a lot of the C-suite and um, other big leaders in the industry is, do they have the digital acumen to understand the implications of these things? And I think that's one of the things where, you know, on the surface, it can look great. And again, I, I think it's fantastic. We're starting to see AI start to inject itself into some of the tools and the resources, practical things where people are getting better at it. But the risk is at the senior level, because you're so disconnected from the work, you can start to just go, well, so like we just, let's just roll forward with this, not understanding the implications of like, whoa, hang on a second. Like, what are we doing in terms of workforce burnout? Or are we actually evaluating the risks associated with putting private information in here? And what are we asking, you know, of, of all these things? And I think that's where, you know, when you start seeing people with really big names in the industry going, can we maybe hit the brakes? on advanced AI for a little bit so we can get caught up on where we're at. 
you know there's something to that where you have to start going, okay, maybe we should start paying attention. And I get for the most people, it's at a stage where it's fun and it's cool and you're doing some cool things and it's advancing quick. But I think we need, I'm just seeing opportunity in, in bigger areas to go, hey, let's, let's just be thoughtful in where this goes. I think yeah, I one of the dangers is that AI is cool. Like I get it. I know I what, right? with AI, but that can get us to do certain things that maybe we shouldn't be doing. Um, and I popped this in the chat too, but yeah. I think it was literally yesterday or two days ago, open AI. So you can go into chat GPT now and make all of your content private. So it won't become part of the training set. It's a very quick um, setting change. So I highly recommend going in and doing that. So it at least alleviates a little bit of the worry in terms of where our content is going when you actually put it in there. But I, I get the coolness of AI. I think it's kind of awesome in many ways in terms of what it can do, but it can lead us into trouble. Well, and I think the other part is we see it continue to integrate into work is um, if, if anybody's not familiar, like research what GPS has done to people's critical thinking skills when it comes to navigation. It's not good. I mean, it's not a good thing. Like the fact that I know people in my sphere who couldn't get to the grocery store down the street if they didn't have ways with them, you know, because they've just become so over-reliant on it to do the human side of what they should do of like keeping an eye on where things are and all this other stuff. You start thinking about that on scale and it's like, is there the risk that we're actually degrading people's critical thinking skills and not being intentional on going, wait, 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 are we using this to make people think more critically and spend more time being creative and thinking critically? Or are we using it to take that away so that they can mindlessly copy and paste prompts into a chat that's just generating this stuff. And I think that's something, especially as we think about like micro learning and stuff like that, where it's like, your role is still really important in this, but as what you're doing with seven taps, I think it's fantastic that if you use it right, you can start to say, Hey, what if less of my time is spent kind of curating and refining and doing this to the content and more of my time is spent on those relational components with the stakeholders and digging into the real problems we're trying to solve and assessing where can I measure whether this is actually having the impact or not versus now I can create 15 courses in the time it took me to do one. I, I always stand for quality, not quantity. And in terms of seven tabs, again, we try to only empower the core functionality. And for me, for example, sometimes I uh, use AI and use uh, seven tabs AI to create a draft. I can fully re-edit it so it actually get yes. a piece of content, but it's still faster rather than I would start from scratch on my own. And that's how it works for me. And it seems that uh, this approach resonates with our users. And in terms of uh, AI and its influence on cognitive skills, I, I'd agree, actually. Uh, I, I'm really concerned about the way uh, kind of a getting the answers that quickly actually can stop us from thinking deeply. And, you know, I remember when I was a schoolgirl, we were not allowed to use calculators and I could do lots of really complicated functions right in my hand in seconds, in a snap. And when I entered university, uh, finally, we could use calculators and, you know, I couldn't done some really simple operations like, um, I don't know, summing up some very simple digits. It <laughs> took some, uh, not like I was kind of a, but it took some seconds and yeah. it was intentional yeah. cognitive uh, kind of a, uh, action. So I don't know what we can actually end up with in terms of students. I'm mainly worried about the new generation. Um, yeah. From, from my side, no, I just, I, I, I only afraid that as a vendor and uh, as, according to what I see in the, technological space, it's so very uh, difficult to pause at the moment because it's a race. Like everyone's yeah. kind of striving for being competitive and um, launching something better, faster. So I, 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 I don't think we can even, you know, no. stop to breathe and evaluate what's happening at the moment. But I just even think back to some of the things Samantha shared, right? So for those who are here who may be going like, so how can this help me with what I'm doing? You know, we've all gotten that Franken presentation or Franken document where you go, oh my gosh, like, I don't even know what this is. 
And I'm even just trying to process what is even in this behemoth that I've now been asked to do something with. And generative AI's ability to quickly analyze that and be able to ask it questions. And again, don't assume that everything it gives you is 100% right. You still need to play a critical role in the thinking. But being able to say like, what are some of the key things that stand out? Because it's great at finding those patterns and trends and being able to say, you know, based on this, these may be some of the things. So if you're looking for an outline or what are some of the key points or things that you would want to focus on? And also, I think thinking deeper about how do you ask more complicated questions and prompts to it. Like what might people get confused by who are not familiar with this language or these acronyms? It's really good at saying, you know, someone who may not be familiar with this may get hung up on these kinds of things that you may want to elaborate on more. And I think our complexity and how we interact with AI, we need to upskill our game on this. Because going back to that, if you're designing a micro learning on a Franken monster, it can help you do that in a way because we all know SME schedules. You, you can't get on them all the time. You can't, you, you don't have that kind of interaction. So the ability to do that and then be able to move quicker and think more critically is extremely powerful. And I think that's a good point too about context, right? So for, for specific audiences, if you're translating something that's a really super highly technical thing, but you wanna to try to put that to plain English for a different audience, right? Like there needs to be somebody in between there sort of facilitating you know, where am I coming from? Where am I going to? Does it make sense? Does the context match? Because yeah, you know, it's it AI that has zero context. It's just got a bunch of data, right? So it doesn't yes. have that piece. And there's got to be a human there for that element, right? And I think that's where going back to personalization, uh, you can do a lot with it. So just as an example, like there was one recently where we looked at, I looked at like an advanced manager course. And I actually used ChatGPT to say, what components of this would be most relevant to a manager who's only had zero to 12 months of people leader experience? And it was able to not just copy and paste what it said, but it actually was able to zone in on, hey, these are the things that would be most relevant to that audience. What are the things that would be most relevant to someone who's leading people of people, maybe not leading direct people. And it was able to kind of zone in on those things. So then we were able to think more critically about it. And I think that's a really powerful way to use it um, to advance things and do things that we just don't have time to do. Like half the time people are like, we'd love to do that. I just don't have time. I guess we'll I think that's there. such a powerful use case, right? Because one of the real powers of AI is being able to find ways to poke holes, I'm gonna mix metaphors, but poke holes in our curse of knowledge, because we all have these empathy gaps. We have our positions, we have our ways of thinking, we have our own experiences. And so we have these uh, intellectual paradigms that we use to approach something. And one of the things that AI gives us the ability to do is to, even if just as a fiction, push against that, being able to say, all right, act as the other person, right? Act as a student, act as uh, someone who just got that job, act as someone who's just um, getting used to instructional design, right? So that allows you to, even if imperfectly, create that persona in the way that we can't because we're just living and, you know, doing our jobs and we learn to think in certain ways. And so yeah. we can use AI to then uh, push against that and recover some kind of experience in a way. Right. But at the same time, that doesn't mean you eliminate the need to have those conversations with that audience and validate it. And I think that's one of the risks is we can go, well, I asked ChatGPT what a first time manager would need out of this. So that's probably good enough. <laughs> well, did you actually ask first time managers if they found it helpful? Oh, no, I figured the AI was better. Well, maybe take a little bit of time to validate your findings. And I think that's the role that we can then play to think critically about that stuff. Exactly. Okay. We could probably <laughs> go way longer on this that, yeah, I know somebody asked like, is this an AI conference? It's not, but hopefully we've given you some things to think about as you're a designer or as you're designing micro learning, because there are some really powerful ways that you can use this for good. And I think that's one of the critical junctures we're at right now is like, well, what is it going to do for us? Well, the ball's in your court in many regards. So uh, Jason, also, thank you so much for being so like impromptu, like, hey, jump on the stage and join the conversation with us. Um, this has been super fun. 
Any other closing thoughts before we transition? And I do have my AI algorithm may need to remind me because I need to scroll back in the chat to see uh, who the who the winner was. I can scroll That's back. Highly, but any highly proprietary, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's that right. Uh, uh, ChatGPT Elena, can you remind me again who won the gift box? I, <laughs> but any other closing thoughts for folks on this one? Well, I, wrapping I, up, uh, I, I cannot say whether AI is good or evil. Like, again, it's a means. And with uh, the thoughtful application and creative and critical thinking behind, probably we should focus on that first um, in this kind of crazy environment. You can really make the best use out of it. And don't be afraid. Just uh, you need to kind of uh, um, treat it carefully and um, be cautious about some potential consequences. Yeah, I, I I would second that. I would I would say you know if, if you haven't yet, go go and kick the tires and and test it and try it and see. Follow some people that were mentioned in the chat there that are that are doing some pretty cool work with that, because I don't think it's going to be you know, I know somebody said this in another context. It's not going to be the AI that takes your job, but it'll be somebody who's using AI well that will take your job. Yes, that is exactly it. Yeah, and I, I think I'm excited about um, somebody. Somebody mentioned this. I'm like, I actually am optimistic that I think it's going to encourage the development of critical thinking skills. I think it's it has the possibility to make people become better communicators because you actually have to communicate with this. I mean, I use ChatGPT all the time. I take all my video transcripts, run it through ChatGPT, and then tell it to tear me apart. Like, where did I talk over people? Where did I? you know, overgeneralize or where did I, and it, it's helping me in that sense. So I think, you know, it can actually help us become more human. Um, if, if we use it right, it can also scorch the face <laughs> of the earth. So, <laughs> all right. With that, my, my GPT prompt was so prompt. It was faster than I could even get back to it. So yes, I did know that Nancy Lee was our first winner, but after a deep analysis of all the comments and things, Maggie Jankowski Congratulations. Let's get a round of applause for Maggie and winning the next gift box for this one. Thank you, everybody. Also, can we get a round of applause for this panel? This was a great discussion on a topic that literally could have probably consumed the better part <laughs> of a day. We scratched the surface, so don't think this is all the answers that you need. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining me on this. I'm going to bump you all backstage, and then I'm going to bring out Megan.